This message is brought to you by DoNotAge.org, the longevity research organisation that's on a mission to extend health span for as many people as possible via products that actually work. Start your journey today at DoNotAge.org and use code LAMA for a 10% discount. That's L-L-A-M-A. A major bucket list has been ticked off and uh, I think it also gives you a kind of confidence that if you can pull off this kind of thing at this age from a particular background, you get feel a calm confidence to take on more now. Jatin Chowdhury is a mountaineer. He recently scaled the world's highest peak, Mount Everest. He did it, he believes, at least in part, by hacking his mitochondria. Hello again, I'm Peter Bowes. Welcome to the Llama podcast. Llama is live long and master aging. This is where we explore the science and stories behind human longevity. This episode is produced in association with the Swiss life science company Amazentis, which is pioneering cutting edge, clinically validated cellular nutrition under its timeline brand. Now, longevity is the goal. Human endurance, which is an essential part of everyday living, is also crucial to those of us who choose to push the boundaries of physical exertion and achievement. And in order to reach the summit of Mount Everest, Jatin Chowdhury embarked on a one-man experiment to optimise the performance of his mitochondria, the cellular powerhouses that we all rely on for peak performance. So how did he do it? He joins us now. From his home in India. Jatin, welcome to the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. Uh, thank you so much, Peter. Uh, it's an honor to be on the show. And I'm really inspired by you, the way you make uh, the, the scientific geeky stuff uh, consumable for the masses. That's very kind of you. Thank you very much. And it's really uh, good to talk to you. And uh, I suppose inspiration works both ways. You've just climbed Mount Everest. Yeah. <laughs> How does that feel to get to the top? Yeah, top of the world feeling it is, literally, right? Because the kind of effort that you have to put in both mentally, physically, in, in some sorts, even spiritually, right? It's uh, it's humongous. And once you reach at the top, the feeling definitely is top of the world, out of the world kind of a thing. And uh, one thing I would like to say is, uh, despite all the facilities that are there, uh, it's not an easy mountain to climb because of the sheer altitude. The physiological stress that you have on your body is, is immense. And I've seen that, experienced that firsthand. And I've seen people fail climbing it uh, because of various reasons. So thankfully, uh, the the way we'll talk forward to is uh, uh, how an average Joe, like a 43-year-old software professional coming off from striking keyboards, right, in a year is able to climb Mount Everest. Uh, Yeah, that's the story. Because you, your day job or your day job has been up until this point uh, in software. Yeah. So it's a sedentary lifestyle and... uh, as it so happened, I, I used to be a very active cyclist before, but then life happened and you are too busy in your life and family happens and you, you're not active anymore. Before you realize you are over 40 and that's when typically the aging shows up, right? You see gray, gray hair in a beard and a hair, right? You realize that uh, the time is short for anything physically demanding that you have to do, you have to do it now. One of the major bucket lists I had was to climb Mount Everest since I was a kid. Uh, then the journey started to figure out how can I do it and come back alive. You're absolutely right. Time is certainly precious. I mentioned that you're talking to us from your home in India. Yeah. Tell us about the area that you live in. I actually come from a desert. It's, it's, a, it's a white desert. In fact, about 40% of salt production happens for India. It happens in my area. So those are like really large salt flats. Interestingly, we don't have many mountains nearby. There are a few volcanic uh, basaltic mountains nearby, but uh, I would not call them mountains. They are like hillocks kind of a thing. But yeah, that's about uh, the westernmost part of India, as flat as flat could be. So very, very different. Very different, very different. Yeah, to the, yeah. the environment surrounding Mount Everest. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a, it's a, I'm, I'm at like zero meters at sea level. You've been very active for most of your life, but you decided you had this ambition in you, that you had this yeah. urge to climb the world's highest mountain. Yeah. Once you'd, I suppose, acknowledged to yourself that that was the goal, yeah. how did, and understanding that it's clearly very, very difficult, difficult and very, very few people can actually achieve it and and survive in those conditions. How did you set about preparing? Yeah, so first I really wanted to see how does my body react to uh, higher altitudes. Uh, So to start with, I did a high altitude trek in India. It's known as a Parangla trek. It's a pretty rigorous trek, 15 days trek through uh, no man's land. 
pretty isolated. Uh, we reach a height about 5,600 meters, which is probably about the highest mountain in Europe. I think it's close to Mount Elbrus site. So once I realized that my body is responding well with uh, the demands of higher altitude, I went forth to climb 6,000 plus meters peak. And that is when I first encountered the superheroes of Himalayas, which are the Sherpa, the Sherpa community of uh, Nepal. These are the people who have spent like 500 to 600 generations uh, in Tibet, and then they moved to Nepal. So their body is physiologically adapted to the demands of a high altitude because their, their previous generation have stayed more than a height of more than 4,000 meters. Uh, that's when I realized that these Sherpas are able to perform. So it could be an average Sherpa will perform better than a very well-conditioned athletic uh, mountaineer over there. And when, when I summited Amadablam, which is like one of the most technical peaks over there, 6,800 meters. And uh, when I experienced firsthand that when I was taking about 8 to 10 breaths per step nearing the summit, and this guy was just taking it like a stroll in the park, I thought that if I have to Mount Everest, I need to read up more on what makes them superheroes over there because it's there's somewhere hidden in their physiology. And if I can hack into it, probably I can do it as well because I had read on Mount Everest that after age of 40, the chances of summit reduces a lot. The probability of fatality also goes up. So I, I knew that I had like six months in hand, I need to do my study. I have like limited time now. The second reason was that I took time off from my job, which you can't do for long, right? So I had this one shot at it, just six months to hack into my biology and see what I can do. And of course, what you're trying to do is essentially hack into your body and replicate the physiology of people who have evolved over generations to survive in these conditions. And you want fast results. You want to do this yeah. quickly in a matter of weeks and months of preparation to live in the environment that these people who can do it much more easily than you can, but they've been doing it for, for many, many years. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, when I read about it, uh, though it's not possible to uh, get that evolutionary mechanisms in, in one go through some kind of miracle drug, but it led me to many insights into how our body works and how our body works at higher altitude in extreme hypoxic environment. That did help me find out the right pathways to, to hack into my biology. Because uh, the, the functioning may be different, but the results are same. If I have to give you a few examples why Sherpas are able to perform better, they definitely have a slightly better lung capacity, not much, but slightly better lung capacity than us. They have about twice the nitrous oxide, which dilates their blood vessels, so more blood can be carried to the muscles. But the most important part is, as we called out, they have the super efficient mitochondria in their uh, cells, which are able to get whatever little oxygen that you have and convert that into, into energy, convert that ADP molecule into ATP molecule. And a very interesting fact that came out from the research was that, in fact, their mitochondrial density in their cells is less than uh, a normal lowlander. Uh, because there's a lot of research and there's a lot of emphasis, even when we exercise this, that when you exercise high intensity, your mitochondrial density will go up, right, and results into a larger oxygen uptake capacity. But interestingly, they have less mitochondria than us, right? But their mitochondria are super efficient, which are, which you can, in, in a way, classify as a good quality mitochondria, but uh, they, they are just at better at, at using the oxygen at higher altitude. So my job was pretty straightforward that you will get only limited fuel that is oxygen to your cell. Now you need to ensure that you have the best mitochondria out there. And as we know that as we age, that the quality of mitochondria drops. And uh, definitely long-term good nutrition and long-term good uh, exercise definitely helps keep that up. But I needed something pharmaceutical to ensure that I, I get into my best shape. Parallelly, I was also researching into Indian medicine, uh, which has been quite a while. And pomegranate plays a very important role in Indian medicine. In fact, that's a go-to fruit if someone is sick. Even when you visit someone in India who is sick, you actually take pomegranates with you. That's very interesting. And uh, in Buddhist, yeah, and in Buddhist texts, it's written that even if like a person is dying, and if you give them pomegranate juice, he'll probably live a few minutes longer. <laughs> so. Uh, more, more of a legend and uh, metaphorical stuff, but it seems that a few thousand years of wisdom in Indian herbs and medicine has also seen the beneficial impacts of pomegranate. But uh, now we understand why. And uh, once you understand why, you can definitely hack into uh, uh, taking greater benefit from the same uh, molecular mechanism. 
So your uh, search through the literature and an understanding, a yeah. growing understanding of the, the mechanisms led you to urolithin A. Yeah. Now, this yeah. is something that we have talked about yeah. a lot on this podcast. Yeah. And uh, if you want to read about the background of urolithin A and might appear, which we're about to discuss, uh, just search in our um, website. We've done uh, countless interviews about this, and I'll put the notes into the show notes as well for this episode. So you discovered urolithin A. Is it something that you'd ever heard of before? Uh, not much. I, I did uh, read about it uh, in a few of the research papers. And uh, I had uh, heard about it in one of the podcasts from one of the biohackers that I uh, follow. So I had this in mind. And when I started researching into mitochondria, urolithin A did come up multiple times. And I thought that this is a time to look for a manufacturer who does that. And interestingly, uh, there is no one else doing that, right? And it was quite a job for me to get it in India from the United States. So yeah, all the research pointed to this uh, molecule, which was helpful in uh, bettering the quality of my mitochondria. So uh, the, the way it works is uh, it improves your uh, mitophagy. The, the, the way your mitochondria, which are not good, which are not optimal at using your oxygen, it will just uh, break it down into components through which the cell can recreate new, fresh, uh, better functioning mitochondria. So, and what I realized was, uh, so in, interestingly, I started on pomegranate herbal supplements before urolithin A because I knew that pomegranate would help me. Uh, but uh, then I realized that not all uh, human beings can actually uh, generate urolithin A from pomegranate's compounds because you need a specific type of gut bacteria to do that. And uh, about one in three people don't have it, right? And other people also that have it to take that copious amount of pomegranate juice would be too difficult for me to get that kind of uh, concentration in my blood. So yeah, Mitopure was the way to go for me. I was trying different kind of stuff, uh, but once I got uh, Mitopure, I knew that I had it. And uh, it was just about uh, looking at my biomarkers for next three months before the Everest expedition. And uh, then definitely the result uh, on the summit. And you mentioned mitophagy, yeah. just to dive into that process sure. a little bit. Essentially, that is the renewal process yeah. of uh, yeah. perhaps getting rid of some of those uh, mitochondria that are, are not working so well. It is essentially making sure that you optimize the mitochondria in your cells, which is something that uh, may not be happening naturally. Yes. Yeah, so uh, normally, as you age, Mitophagy as a process does not work as efficiently as you are when you are young. So uh, you, you end up with a lot of mitochondria which are not functioning well. And urolithin A, what it does is it gets into the cell and it it's, uh, binds to certain receptors which uh, triggers the microphagy of uh, inefficient or the bad gotten uh, mitochondria. So what did you do next? Clearly, you at this point understood yeah. the science. You discovered your lithin A and Mitopure, yeah. which is the commercial name yeah. for the urolithin A that is being provided in this supplementation. How did you test it? Yes. Yeah, so uh, the thing was, for, for me, it was just when I got my Mitopure in my hand, it was three months to go for my expedition. For me, it was to keep everything as it is, uh, what was working. So my my uh, my nutrition, other nutrition did not change. My sleep schedule did not change. My exercise regime did not change. So the only thing that I added was uh, Mitopure. And for me, I need to now look at the biomarkers. For example, if I am getting better efficient mitochondria, as my VO2 max should go up. Because otherwise, I have been working out for some time. So it means that I would not get immediate uh, extra capillaries to supply the blood to my muscles, right? Or extra lung capacity. So the only thing that can get better right now is uh, mitochondria. And my VO2 max actually went up from 48 to 51 during my uh, period before uh, the expedition. So that's quite a jump. Uh, 51 is the max that I've ever been uh, until now which I didn't expect that to happen. And I'm not really sure it's because of my pure, but my resting pulse, and I'm talking about my average resting pulse for the entire month, it went down from 47 to 45. That's quite a big uh, decrease, if you see, on a monthly average. Do you record your resting pulse 24 hours a day? And I assume that low point comes when you're sleeping. Yeah, absolutely. It, it comes when you're sleeping and I, I record it for 24 hours. And when these two happened, right, I was then feeling very positive about the entire expedition and probably that had some placebo effect as well, maybe, I don't know. And we'll continue this conversation in just a moment. Hey, quick question for you. Are you someone who wants to be fit, healthy and happy? 
And what if I told you you could get your dream body by simply just listening to a podcast? I'm Josh. And I'm KG. And we are the hosts of the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast. Listen, we get it. Fitness isn't easy. Carbs, no carbs. Just stop, okay? It doesn't have to be that complicated. And that's why we made this podcast. We get straight to the facts so you can become your best you. So the way to check us out is click the link in the show notes or search Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast on any of the major podcast platforms. We'll see you soon. This is the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. Our guest is Jatin Chowdhury, a mountaineer on a mission to optimise his mitochondrial health. Well, you could say that you managed to achieve that. At what point were you satisfied? Because clearly this is a one-man process. You say you tried to keep everything else the same as you were measuring the effect of the urolithin A, the Mitopure supplementation. But I'm curious as to what point you could actually feel results. Yeah, so I could feel it uh, in second month itself. I think about a month and a half into it, I could see the difference in my VO2 max. And the way I measure my VO2 max is through a power meter and a heart rate monitor. So it's pretty accurate uh, if you see in, in, in cycling. So once I reached 50 from 48, I knew that this is working. Because never before I had reached like 40 to 50 so fast. So, and 50 has been the maximum that I've ever been in my life. So, I, I knew that there's something good. And then once it did 51 in about uh, two and a half months, I knew that this stuff is working. And I, I kept on taking it right till the Camp 4. So, I popped in my Pure even on Camp 4 uh, of uh, Mount Everest. And then uh, one thing that also gave me confidence was... Uh, having discussion with other physicians. So uh, my childhood friend is an orthopedic surgeon and uh, I shared with him all the research and he said that, yeah, this looks very promising. And uh, he even talked about probably this something which can be useful for uh, post-operative care of elderly patients, right? So uh, if they are on, on, on this kind of thing, probably even the recovery could be better. So uh, that kind of an expert... The suggestion from my friend also gave me confidence that, yeah, the, the research is in place. The results are, are pretty good. So uh, I was very confident that, yeah, this is doing me better. Yeah, that's very interesting because, of course, uh, muscle strength and endurance, which is uh, all part and parcel of this, is crucial as, as anyone gets older. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily an extreme athlete, but just, let's say, ordinary people getting older, frailty being one of the key points in people's lives. Yeah. that begins to affect them very negatively. Things begin to yeah. go wrong once a, a human being is frail, mobility, potential for accidents and that kind of thing. So that's why, more broadly speaking, this is interesting. Have you continued to use this product ever since? Oh, yeah, I have. I have uh, continued now and I'm also getting my parents onto it because uh, my, my parents are 70 plus now. And uh, definitely I saw the benefit and I would like to get them at least on a four month uh, course to see uh, if, if they benefit or not. In terms of actually conquering Mount Everest, you say you continue to use Mitopure all the way through. Did yeah. you use it right through up until reaching the peak? I used right till the peak, so till Camp 4. And uh, so, so you, when you go to Mount Everest, there's a long trek that you have to do from the last uh, landing that you do in helicopter. So it's about 10 days, 8 to 10 days of trek that you need to do to go to the base camp. And then you do multiple rotation to higher camps to acclimatize your body. And then you have the final five-day summit push uh, onto the summit. All this throughout, I was taking the Mitopure. So I did not miss it for a single day, even during my acclimatization rotations or even during my summit push. I really benefited from uh, Mitopure. And uh, when I really saw the benefit was during the first uh, rotation. At first rotation, we went to a height of 6,800 meters. It's about the same height uh, which I submitted in uh, last November. Uh, that's Ama Dublin. And last November, I was really struggling. It was about 8 to 10 breaths per step kind of a thing. And here, I was taking about 2 or 3 breaths per step. And last 10 meters, when I really struggled on Ama Dublin, I actually challenged the Sherpa for a sprint. Let, let's sprint to the top. Like 6,800 meters is probably higher than any mountain outside Himalaya, except Akankagua in Andes. So that's that's quite high if you, if you see right and and to really sprint to the top is something and Sherpa was like, what do you do for a fitness? I'm like nothing nothing special as such right. So when a Sherpa comments that what you do for a fitness it means a lot for you as a mountaineer because uh, they are the superheroes of the mountain and they see all kind of mountains with them uh, all through their uh, climbing years. So that was quite a compliment. 
And just to celebrate that compliment, what I did was I had this extra pouch, empty pouch of Multipure with me. I took it with me and I took a click on the summit. And just as a gratitude, a thank you note, I sent them to the Instagram account. I didn't even contact their, uh, the company representatives. I just sent to their Instagram account that thank you so much. Your product helped me a lot. And then uh, they reached out and they're great guys. It has been a friendly relationship for last month and a half. Yeah. I think it would be fascinating, wouldn't it, if there was a large clinical trial involving lots of individuals with some element of control as part of that experiment, really to determine using much more data the effect of this kind of supplementation. Because I suppose cynics listening to you could say, well, you are just one person. There might have been other factors because this was the first time that you'd actually managed to scale Mount Everest. And that perhaps for some, it might be a leap to say that this kind of supplementation had such a significant effect for you. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think uh, we, we need more clinical trials. Uh, and I think uh, whatever I read till now, uh, all, all the studies, right, they were, they were at or in the environment which are which are like normal environments i think uh, if we have studies which are in such kind of extreme uh, hypoxic environments probably we'll will get more stark results and that would be more indicative whether uh, that is working or not because if if you see uh, uh, climbing in high altitude is a game of mitochondria uh, straight and simple right so if you really want to see the impact of mitopure i think we should have a study at at least uh, everest base camp which is around 5300 meters should be good enough that's interesting and actually i was going to ask you uh, about the response of others other people around you experienced climbers that they clearly noticed the difference in you. Yeah. A Sherpa nosing is a great thing. It's a huge compliment, the best compliment that you can get. When a Sherpa asks you, like, what do you do for fitness? And, and because it's not that uh, I've been an active mountaineer as such, I could see that also in my, I don't know, uh, it's more anecdotal, but uh, when I saw summit photographs of me and my team members, you would see their face are puffed up, right? And uh, you, you could see the, the, the work of altitude on, on, on them. And it, it seems that their body is inflamed. And when I saw my pictures, like I look the same, smiling the same on, on the summit or on the base camp. And I felt great as well. And uh, when the next day we came down to camp two, what you typically do is you take a rest day at camp two because you've already been through 40 hours of ordeal without much food and sleep. You take a rest day at camp two and then come down. But uh, it was just me and one Russian climber. Both of us came down the same day. So that also speaks a lot because I did not feel any aches or pains or any kind of inflammation in the body. The physiological stress was very low. So though I could not measure, but uh, having measured my C-reactive protein, which is a marker for inflammation, would have been great. And as you said before, right, I think we should probably need a clinical study for this thing because I, I definitely see that there's an improvement uh, in overall body inflammation, even under extreme physiological stress. Yeah, I agree. I think that would be very interesting. Just tell me what else you do for uh, physical activity in terms of, of preparation and exercise. So normally I, I love uh, biking, cycling. So I, I cycle. I may run a bit, not much of a runner. So and uh, there are occasional weight training sessions that I do. That That's about it. So these are the three things that I do. So we're normally mainly zone two kind of a cycling and uh, sub-maximal weight training to not. What's the next adventure? Yeah, so next is, uh, I'll, I'll give you a brief story before I tell my next adventure. So because of my Amar Dublin Summit and my training, I did a one-month training as well in Nepal at KCC. So I was chosen the expedition leader for my team of 11 members. And all the expedition leaders have to go and meet the secretary of Nepal. Because as a, as a team leader, you are also the eyes and ears of uh, the tourism ministry. So the littering doesn't happen and all kind of rules of uh, mountaineering are followed over there. So there I met a Korean climber over there. Uh, and uh, he's a very famous climber, was planning to do the south face of Loche, the most difficult one. And he asked me that how much, like, what's the population of India? And I told him like 1.5 billion. And he said, why come no one has ever done a full explorer Grand Slam, which involves climbing the seven summits. But more importantly, it's reaching the South Pole and North Pole from the outer coastline. And I told him, I don't know why. So he asked me like, oh, what's your age? I said, 43. If you're doing Mount Everest, you can do that. And I thought that probably I should do that. So the, the next one is to go from outer coastline, that is Hercules Inlet, to the South Pole, which is about 1130 kilometer of skiing expedition. Uh, no one has done it from India. 
I'd like to be the first one to do it, so more can follow. But uh, yeah, that's the, that's the next thing. And I think that is where the inflammation part will come handy for me because it's a very rigorous expedition, about 8 to 10 hours of uh, high physical activity for two months straight in very harsh conditions. So looking forward to Mitopure to help me over there as well. So this is a podcast about human sure. longevity in all of its forms, whether you're an extreme athlete or not. And I'm curious, we tend to look forward the decades ahead and, and different people have different aspirations about their own longevity and how they approach the process of, of living in those decades ahead. Do you have a particular vision of the years ahead for yourself? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So... Uh... In fact, uh, when we were climbing, uh, uh, we had this gentleman from Switzerland. He is a 70-year-old climber. And uh, till now, I had absolutely no idea what kind of old man I want to be. And when I saw him, he he had braces on, he was struggling, but he did climb till balcony, which is 8,400 meters. And uh, the, the, the the kind of courage there was in, right? And I told him that, yeah, you are exactly the kind of 70 year old man I want to be. <laughs> so... Yeah, definitely. I would I would like to uh, keep my journey of exploration uh, ongoing with mountains, but as well as my own physiology, like the, the experiment with mitopure has uh, definitely allowed me to go through much research. And I, I, I feel that this lot can be done in terms of having a, a healthy lifespan and, and, and probably longer than what our parents are used to. So I think there's a lot of research that's going on, which uh, which needs to be read, right? And and the, the kind of work that you are doing, Peter, it's like if more people know about it, right? More people will get interested. And once you have an industry, then then the funding also comes in. I, I still feel that this entire research is underfunded right now. We need more money over here. So, and, and, and old age should be seen as a, a disease, right? And, and should be worked upon as such. So, yeah, I'd like to uh, continue my exploration in, in, in figuring out what can help me have a longer healthy lifespan so I can do all this much more right with my children grandchildren who knows what exactly and uh, so many people say that to me that uh, ultimately it's about the children and the grandchildren uh, and being around for them and perhaps opening opportunities for them as they grow older as well it's interesting to me that you are inspired by the science that you've delved into it you've benefited from it and and you see the potential and I also agree with you that it wouldn't it be wonderful if there was so much more funding for this kind of research. Yeah. In terms of others around you, have they been inspired to perhaps follow in your footsteps? I'm just curious uh, how your achievements have inspired yeah, others. Yes, so uh, I first I'll talk in terms of mitopure because that was very evident. So when I came down and told this to my friends, uh, two of my friends from US immediately ordered and then uh, one friend from India was like, how do I order from India, right? Because they are still struggling. So he was again waiting for someone to come from US and get it for him. So who? Uh, so I used to send a daily note to everyone, all of my friends and family. So I typically do not uh, publish publicly on either Insta or Facebook, uh, kind of a shy socially. So, But I do regularly post a daily note uh, to my friends and family. And I told them about my training. I told them this is the stuff I'm trying. I told them about my results and then uh, the overall Everest expedition. And uh, in fact, as I said before, many of my friends are really excited about uh, gifting it to their parents because of uh, the, the, the distinct benefit, right? The first thing that comes to the mind is that there's something my parents should have. So, yeah, they have benefited in terms of uh, this research. And they've also benefited that uh, how come a 43-year-old guy, right? Not exactly, I'm not a sports guy. So I used to be active, but not exactly. The, the, the most fit guy that you find in the gym uh, can actually think of uh, doing an Everest in 10 months and uh, structurally can do that. So I think that gives them a lot of motivation in their area of life. Uh, everyone have a different Mount Everest to climb. It's not exactly a mountain for them, right? It's something else they want to do. So they also think of uh, hacking their way into uh, their Mount Everest and see what they can do. Clearly, there is a huge sense of achievement once you manage to scale a mountain like Mount Everest, the highest peak in, on Earth. Does that glow of achievement stay with you? It's been a, a few weeks now. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, that the emotions, uh, they change. Uh, definitely, it's a sense of achievement and elation kind of a thing. But uh, normally, like last few weeks, it has turned more into a calmer kind of a feeling because a major bucket list has been ticked off. So it's it's more like, okay, now, now one, one major thing is done. So what next kind of a thing? And I think it also gives you a kind of confidence that if you can pull off uh, this kind of thing, 
at this age uh, from a particular background you can you, you get feel a, a calm confidence to take on more now well jate i think it's hugely inspiring uh, congratulations on thank your you. achievement uh, and all the best for your future adventures really good to talk to you thank you thanks so much for joining thank you so much and if you'd like to read more about jatin's adventure i'll put some details along with a transcript of this conversation into the show notes for this episode you'll find them at the live long and master aging website that's lamapodcast.com double l a m a podcast.com you can also find there all of our previous interviews on this subject exploring the importance of mitochondrial health for physical endurance this episode was brought to you in association with amazentis a swiss life science company which is pioneering cutting edge clinically validated cellular nutrition under its timeline brand Lama Podcast is a Healthspan Media production. We're available on all of the main podcasting platforms, now including YouTube. You can follow us in social media at Lama Podcast and you can direct message me at Peter Bowes. Thank you so much for listening. Health optimization is what this podcast is all about, and that means taking care of our mitochondria, the energy centers of our cells. Physical strength, avoiding frailty is key, and that's why the science behind urolithin A and the work of Timeline Nutrition is so interesting. You can find out more and get a discount code at our website and in the show notes for this episode.